I've been at Aritzia for 18 years, off and on, quit twice, come back. So it was my third round working there. Um, they know not to mess with me now, right? Yeah, they do. That's right. Um, and I was an English teacher before this. Uh, have had six different roles with Aritzia when I started. We had six stores and we just opened our 80th in LA, which is super exciting. I was working in that store on Monday and it's so, I just want to live there. It's just so <laughs> cool. Um, and it's exciting and fun at Aritzia. I mean, we've been growing nonstop. There's never a dull moment. Uh, launching in new markets in the US is so exciting, teaching people about our brand. Um, and essentially, I've, so I've held six different roles with the company, all different areas of the business. And, um, you know, when you're a small business as you guys know you're a generalist you do bits of everything and that's how it was then and I feel like I'm one of those people that's made it through that isn't good at one thing I don't think I'm really good at any one single thing but I'm like don't tell anyone I can just I can I can exist here understanding Aritzia so I think one of my one of the things I can do is help other people be effective at Aritzia and so that's a lot of how I spend my time. My role right now is being accountable for staff for the company. So across retail and corporate, um, supply chain, design, all areas of the business, which is cool because I get to see and touch a bit of everything. So I feel really lucky. It's an awesome place for me to be. At Aritzia, every single meeting has an agenda, so by force of habit. Uh, I've just laid out areas that I thought we could talk through. We can do some in depth, we can do some none at all, or we can add to this. So employer brand, I was gonna speak about briefly, hiring managing your team, training, remunerating, and then legal and compliance, which I freaked out the, someone in the last group who's an HR consultant, and I was like saying a few things. She was like, I don't think, I was like, ah, it's fine. So <laughs> none of this is binding, it's all good. Okay, so employer brand. This is on a blue sky slide, not by accident, uh, because uh, a lot of people, you will, you're all talking about your consumer brand, and your consumer brand is what your customers see. Um, your employment brand is what a lot of people don't really talk about, and that's the, uh, I call it behind the curtain. So your customers and clients see your consumer brand, but anyone that works with and for you is a part of your employer brand. And so your employer brand, you can set an intention of what you want that to be. It could be to help other women entrepreneurs. It could be to uh, provide a place, a safe place for, a safe and a confident place for people to learn to be great leaders in the future. You can set it for whatever you want it to be. It will also be what it is, meaning that sounds more like poetic than it meant, than I meant it to sound, but your employment brand is just uh, a result of what it's like to work for you. So you can set your intention, your blue sky intention for what you want your employer brand to be, and then be aware that it is a reflection of what it's like to work with you, work with and for you. So I encourage you to articulate uh, what your employer brand is because it will allow, it connects and threads through all aspects of hiring people, managing them, training, developing, all of those things. Um, and it helps set a unified intention for anyone else that manages people in your business. Okay, hiring. So, recruiting, hiring. A um, few points here that I thought would be helpful to touch on. So, I think what's really important is to be clear on your what before you start looking. And prioritize that, blue sky and non-negotiables. So what is it that you're looking for someone to take on or be accountable for? Um, and I think there's both a what sketch and a who sketch. So your what sketch would be, okay, I need someone to be accountable for X in my business. Um, in a perfect world, they would also do Y and Z, but X is like non-negotiable. And then the who would be sort of a sketch of the type of person that would work well. So you might say, I need someone who's totally complimentary to me, and I am uh, highly entrepreneurial, not super structured, and I need someone who's going to be the, the buttoned up person who's gonna be really good at the back end. Um, so sketch what that person would look like, and it's gotta be someone you wanna spend time with. You know, obviously you guys in your businesses, it's like someone you can sit beside a plane on and not, um, want to poke your eye out probably by the end of the flight. Um, and, and, but also be flexible to what you find. So know what you're looking for, but be flexible to what you come across, because it's like a relationship. You're like, I didn't know I needed this until I met you, and then <laughs> now this is important. So uh, I think that that's really important too. So to go back to your list of requirements, 
um, and to, to uh, adjust that as you need to. But I think if you just say, I need some help, and you start meeting a bunch of people, you, what you want and what you need will become muddled by who's in front of you. So to try and be disciplined to knowing what you're looking for, but being flexible to what you find. And then to assess on the right thing. So this is a hard one. So I believe we're all good people, and so we all see the good in other people, but you can't hire everyone that sits in front of you. Um, and you have to make sure that you are not just uh, taken by one thing, um, sort of the halo effect. So if someone's really good at one thing, you assume they'll be good at everything else, or you gloss over everything else. I think we all do that. It's like, oh my gosh, she's so great because she plays soccer, I play soccer, and this is so amazing. And you're like, she didn't go to school and she can't use Excel, and you're like, okay, well that's, we can figure that out. She's so great. Um, but maybe you can't figure it out. So uh, to, and, and this happens with hiring managers all the time that I work with. Um, and so if you, if you decide the what and the who sketch, then everything you do after you meet someone, as an example, um, you're gonna go back and look and rate them on those things. So you're going to say, out of 10, how do they fare against these things? Um, and how do you assess for what's important? I think there, in my experience, there are people who are excellent interviewees and crummy employees. And then there are ex people who are exceedingly terrible in an interview, but they can have such great substance. And so I used to be, I never had experience for what I did, and so I would be more taken by the like presentation. And then I learned from my mistakes that uh, you cannot look at how somebody necessarily presents in an interview. Um, one of the things I feel, I believe strongly in is people, you want to know who they truly are. And you can best figure that out by putting them at ease. So whatever you can do, I'm super informal when I interview. Um, it's like cash, casual, not, and people just get at ease. And then they can just talk to you about who they are and you can get a sense of who they really are. So um, the other way you can really find out who someone is is to see them in different settings. I always encourage people to meet someone at least twice. Um, because it's again, it's the the uh, the apartment effect. I'm like, you you go look at this apartment. You're like, it's so beautiful, and I'm gonna have breakfast in this nook, and look at the sunlight. And then the second time you go, there's like no room for your shoes, and the faucet's drippy, and you're like, yeah, this is not really gonna work out. So it's sort of the realistic second view of someone. And if you can see them in more than one setting, it's the best way to get a sense of who they are. And one of the things I've started doing at Aritzia, I did it in pieces, but now I do it as a rule, is a practical exercise of some sort. So to see how someone actually works is the best way I find, and it's heartbreaking. Because I've met so many people, I'm like, they're so good, they're gonna be so good, this is amazing. We just have to do a presentation, but once we do that, we're totally gonna hire them. And they come in and I'm like, it's not really not good, it's really bad, we can't hire that person. And so it's <laughs> such a, it's a heartbreaking exercise, however, um, I believe anything you're going to find out in their first two weeks on the job, you may as well find out before you hire them, right? I mean, you're going to save yourself, yourself some time and energy. So I believe, first of all, that the, the only person that I want to interview somebody is they're either assessing and or impressing. And again, when I say impress, it doesn't mean just the shiny. Impress means sort of what it's like to be here. So. Um, I try to keep it to the, the fewest visits possible while still achieving my objective. So uh, with our, our consumer brand, I always say managing or uh, respecting our customer's time is a top priority. And so I think the same way with candidates. People, it's nerve wracking, they take time off. What if they need childcare? It's like really maximize the time when they come in. So what we tend to do is at the most basic level, so hiring, hiring a style advisor, we can do that in one meeting. We're happy with that. Um, but we have a set of criteria and people that are approved to rate. So when I say one meeting, it's one meeting with someone who's like, I've like certified them essentially. Um, and then as I move up, the number of meetings, the number of people that meet the person and the number of meetings can be different. So um, the number of people will go up to five probably. Um, and then, but those can happen in succession. So the number of visits I have, I try to keep it to a max of four visits. And that would be for like a C level or a VP level person. Um, and I put placeholders. So we do that so that and you don't tell the candidate they've got a placeholder. You say, oh, you know, can you be here for about an hour and a half? And you don't tell them you're going to meet the CEO because then as soon as you meet them and decide they shouldn't meet the CEO, then it's, you can't meet the CEO because the dog's sick. You know, you have to say something. So um, uh, I try to keep it to between one and five people. And I try to keep it between uh, one visit and four visits. 
if I can. And the visits could include a walkthrough of your store. So for us, if we're hiring a store manager, we're gonna do a walkthrough of our store and talk to them about our business. You could do that with restaurants, with your shop. Um, <coughs> so seeing them in different settings so that you get as much of a 360 view of the person as possible. And to set out in advance when you have that many different people interviewing what each person is looking for. So we try to separate out, um, my team really focuses on, well, we kind of do everything, but we really use the hiring manager for the technical skills and we try to cover smarts, culture fit, everything else. Um, it doesn't mean the manager doesn't have a say in those things, but we don't want to take up their time trying to assess for all these things when that is really our expertise and what they know is um, technical pattern making, which is what I don't know, so I can't assess for that. Mm -hmm. um, but to try and, our objective is to ultimately say, okay, what are all the things we need to assess for and to make it a one-way stream. Uh, so you, you pass the non-negotiable gates first mm -hmm. and then, uh, as like I said, as few visits as possible with the most concise hiring team. Every single role that's open, I look internally first. Every single role. So we can't have, we don't have a VP of manufacturing on our Robson Street store, so obviously we're gonna have to go and find that person. Mm -hmm. So what I, I like to think of it as hiring at two levels. Best and brightest, up and comer, or top rated seasoned professional. And I don't, and, and when I'm talking to my team and hiring managers and we talk about candidates, I'm like, oh, hold on, which are they? And if they're like, well, I'm like, they're neither, and we can't hire them. People will move through the middle as they grow in their career, but the point is to hire people who they could have zero experience, but they're so smart. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what's important to you guys, we have what's important to us. Smarts, personality, culture fit, all of those things. And skills are secondary when you're a best and brightest. Um, but when you're a top rated seasoned professional, skills are the most important thing. I might be willing to skimp a little on some of the other areas. So. Um, the best and brightest, 100% of those I, I would love to have from stores. We still need to have a pipeline of people that come in who have done their MBA or who have great experience elsewhere. Um, but I will never, I've never hired somebody who has like an arts degree into something. So I'm like, well, there's 50 of you in our stores and they've earned the right to have this opportunity. And most of the, our CEO would tell you 80% of the reason people don't work out is culture fit. Well, they've already demonstrated that, right? They understand the organization, they're committed, they get your customer front line. It's like, it's a no brainer. And our executive team, our president started in stores, our EVP retail started in stores, our VP merchandising started in stores, I started in stores. And, and so we, we all came to be where we are because someone gave us an opportunity. And there are those of, there are people just like us or better than we were then in our stores. So we've created, actually we're just launching something we're calling a STARS program. So it's essentially identifying top talent within our field and tracking them. So my idea is they can't go left or right without us knowing about it. Like I don't want to lose good talent out the back door because someone at Loblaws gave them an opportunity as an inventory control person. It's like, no, no, you do that with us. You shouldn't be a junior accountant there. You should do that with us. So. Um, Always, always, always looking inside first. The hardest thing about it though is as we get more geographically dispersed and we have more and more people, how do you, how do you know who they all are? And one of the challenges I have is um, they, if I ask our regional managers to put forward all the best people, they won't put forward someone that I think, I'll go out to the stores working and I'm like, that person is a nine out of 10. How on earth have I never heard of them? well, you know, their attitude's a bit, I'm like, well, maybe they don't want to be a cashier anymore. I mean, I'm not saying you should have a bad attitude, but I'm, I wouldn't be that motivated either. Like maybe it's because we're not managing them properly. So again, how do you get your own direct view to your talent um, as well as you have to, there has to be trust and there has to be a process to make sure that the good people are bubbling up to you. What I'm doing with our, our top high potential people is I'm meeting with them and I'm giving them an overview of our organization. Most of them don't know anything exists besides marketing and I don't know, they don't really know what exists. Like no one gave us a layout of what was possible. So I draw our structure for them and I figure out if they're a technical expert, if they're sort of business acumen, if they're on the creative side or the people side. So I kind of create buckets. Mm -hmm. And then just through that conversation with them, I 
by the time at, at by the time I get to the end of the conversation, I'm like, okay, so what areas, if I had to highlight based on what we discussed, what areas are you interested in, I know what they're gonna say because you can just tell through the discussion. So I can focus them a bit in an area. And then from there I meet have them meet with the like a hiring manager or one of the line managers for that function. So I'm like, then you can get more detailed information about what this is really like. And then from there I'll say come in and shadow somebody. And again, that's a lot of investment, but that's because it's your top people. Um, and if I don't think the person is going to necessarily be the highest potential, I won't bring them past that process. Mm -hmm. So I'll look at their education, I'll look at their performance to date, I'll have a meeting with them, I'll give them an overview, I'll help sort of start to channel them from a career path standpoint, and then I'll, I'll, I'll funnel them into that area to have a more detailed discussion. There are a lot of things I ask when I'm interviewing someone or in scenarios, like you know, asking practical questions, but oftentimes I'll say, um, what frustrates you at work? And you can tell by what people say, you're like, oh, well, that's what we do all day, every day, so you'll hate it here. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time. And like, you can tell them that. Or you can say, um, you know, uh, what, uh, under stress, how would your coworkers describe you? How, like, what do you, what do you like? Because I can see what you're like today, but what do you like when things are like going south? Um, you know, try to get, gauge as much about how someone conducts themselves as possible in advance. And then what I would say is once they're in it, and if it's really, you know what good looks like and what it doesn't look like, and to make, to, to give people a fair shot, but to also make decisions quickly. Let's stop at remunerating. Okay, so what is the right starting salary for someone? This is uh, hard. Um, you could say what, okay, I like to find out what is somebody making and what do they want to make? And uh, I figure out if they're worth paying that. That to me is the right starting salary. Um, and to think, like I have on here for remunerating, get creative. Um, everybody values different things and some people value time off and some people value, um, like I said, wage, education, and opportunity is how we look at remunerating. So there's everyone needs to pay their rent and pay their bills. You can't replace a fair wage. Um, the education, what they're going to get from spending time with you and the people on your team and what they're going to learn, that's invaluable. And then opportunity to take on more and do more things. And if you find someone who sees that combination in your business, um, that's usually someone who's a good bet. And not the person who's gonna be like, it's just cold hard cash, because guess what? Some will offer them $2 more and they'll go. Yeah. Um, and what's the point? So you want someone who's gonna be as invested and excited about what you're doing and what they see they can be a part of um, so that there's the Simon Sinek why, like, like why am I even doing this? And if there's a connection to the why, then a dollar uh, down the street isn't necessarily gonna entice them. Um, there has to be more of an emotional connection to what you're doing. But what I would say is, what do you make now and what do you wanna make? And what I sometimes do is I'll hire someone at a rate and I'll say, in six months, we're gonna review it and I'll give you $2 more an hour if you're doing what I think you can do. So you can show them progress um, in writing so they feel confident in it too. As a manager, you could have someone who's at the most junior end of manager and the really senior end of manager. You can be someone who's a manager, who's managed a huge area of the business and you can have someone who's been a manager at a tiny company. So, so uh, we don't create those structures because they're kind of artificial for us. And so I am not transparent except to say, look, I've never seen somebody leave here who's effective. Um, I've never seen someone leave because they've lacked opportunity or compensation. So I can, I can set you up to talk to 10 people who will tell you the same story. So there is an element of you're asking for people's trust, um, but I, I paint that picture because I can say that um, with confidence because that, that is true. Um, but you can, there's nothing wrong with having salary bands if that's what works within your structure and if there, you know, there are professional people that are used to that kind of this title, this pay, at this pound of time. So there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I like to leave flexibility for um, treating people differently based on who they are and how they perform. I actually was just telling a story. I had someone resign on Monday who's amazing and I was just like, her story wasn't adding up. I'm like, it's not adding up. I'm like, I'm just going to tell you it's not adding up. I don't get it. I don't get it. 
doesn't make sense to me. I refused to, I took my dad's line. I refused to accept that. <laughs> I don't know, it works for him. I thought I would try it and so far. But so I just spoke to her and I finally, just before I came here, I was like, breakthrough because she didn't want to say because she's not, she's the loveliest person. She's not greedy, didn't want to say, you know what, my partner's job is super unstable. He's a musician and I got offered these benefits, this kind of um, RSP, this da 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 da, all these things that we don't have um, and I didn't want to say she didn't want to say that because she didn't want to expect that to be matched and I was like dude if that's important to you like I'm like you can't leave you're amazing so we're not leaving this room till we figure this out and it took three meetings for me to get that out of her and we get along really well and she like we I was like on the way here I was like oh she's in I called I called someone while I was driving I was like can't type I think I got her breakthrough so I am gonna keep her and I love that she didn't come in with some entitlement, but I'm also like, I can't fix what I don't know is a problem. You can Google different um, uh, tools that you can, you can use for discussions with people to help them even figure out what's important to them because they might not even be articulating it. But what I always say is, I say, hey, you know, talk, update with someone and then say, how's it going? You know, what's going on? What's, what's frustrating you? What's hard? Is there anything hard? You know, or I could even be so direct as to say, what could someone offer you that would make you leave? And sometimes yeah. people don't like to say that because they're like, then you're mentioning leaving and then they'll think they're really good and they might leave. I'm like, well, you may as well know because otherwise they are really good and they'll end up getting something that you don't know is important to them. And this person, it's like, I'm on her constantly. It's just, she's got something inside her and she said to me, I'm so grateful for you talking to me about this and I really didn't think anyone would want me this much. And I was like, okay, well then I've failed. If, even though I know I haven't because I'm on her, but I know she's got an intrinsic thing that she's never good enough. And so no matter what I say to her, it's she's never good enough. So she even is like, I thought maybe you'd be relieved. I was like, why? You're a nine out of 10. I'm not relieved, you're not leaving. And I kept saying, you're just not leaving. So <laughs> I'm gonna tie you down. I'm gonna, you down. I'm gonna lie down in front of your car, you're not leaving, yeah. So um, yeah, finding that stuff out is tough but so valuable. If there's anything I can do to help, please shoot me an email um, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do anything or share anything that would be of use to you. So thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.